Joshua is the uh, next panelist to speak. He is a professor in computer science at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He got his PhD at MIT um, in the artificial intelligence lab working in computational vision, and he has been a pioneer after that in work in vision, especially with the ge geometry of vision, and the recognition of objects under variable lightning. Um, he has been uh, um, chairman of the computer science department in Jerusalem. He is also a serial entrepreneur. His uh, last uh, company, Mobileye, is making devices that allow cars to see. And uh, in fact, I'm, I'm very proud to say that Amnon was a student and a postdoc in my group. Um, he's a dear friend and a colleague, and he's probably the, my exhibit number one in a list showing that AI, and in particular machine learning and computer vision, have achieved impressive human-level performance in certain narrow domains. I'm not. Uh, Patrick Woodstone mentioned yesterday that commercial distraction had an adverse effect on the growth of AI. So I guess I'm representing one of those distractions uh, uh, this morning. Um, uh, 12 years ago, I founded uh, Mobileye. It's a company that has today about 250 employees to develop sensors, cameras for, uh, for then an emerging field of driving assistant uh, systems. Uh, at that point, I understood that in order to make significant progress in, in computer vision, one requires to master resources that go way beyond what I can do in, in, in academia. Uh, so far, we spent more than $200 million in, in developing what I'll be showing. So um, the automotive industry, the cars that, that, that you drive, is the first really wide-scale, high-demanding introduction of uh, computer vision. You find there areas of uh, visual object detection, notably detecting cars, detecting pedestrians, detecting traffic signs, uh, visual motion uh, perception, like uh, ego motion uh, estimation, collision assessment with other cars, uh, very demanding performance uh, specifications, more than 99% availability, uh, very low false positives. For example, in detecting cars and pedestrians, one expects a false positive once every 20 hours of driving and a false activation of brakes once every 200,000 kilometers of, of driving. So this is very, very uh, demanding. And in some of those very narrow domains, one even achieves better performance than uh, human vision, especially in the traffic sign recognition and also in the pedestrian detection, especially when pedestrians are hidden in, in clutter. And the future roadmap in this industry is even more challenging. It's semi-autonomous driving starting from 2013 towards even more extensive autonomous driving 2015 and, and forward. So I'll, I'll explain a bit what is that field and uh, what are the challenges and, and what's in stock in, in the future. So Takeo mentioned how difficult computer vision is, so I'll not uh, expand on that. I'll just mention that in object recognition, we generally have two types of uh, object recognition. We have one that's a category level, like people, cars, faces, uh, and then we have a within category level like Tommy, like my car, my home, and, and so forth. And then we have motion, action, uh, understanding, action, uh, depth, color, and, and so forth, and individual perception. Now, detecting people is notoriously difficult. This is a very active area in, uh, in the scientific community in computer vision. Uh, Tommy was the pioneer of introducing machine learning and pedestrian detection in the mid-90s, so he knows how difficult the task is. And it's still a very ongoing uh, problem. And this is because that people, the variability, the image variability that people generate is very, very large. People tend to be found in domains that have a lot of clutter, objects that look like pedestrians near them. And it's, it's very, very difficult to reach a very high level of, of performance. So. Let me start with a commercial by, by Volvo. I don't have any equity in, in the company. But <laughs> so I'll show you a commercial by, by Volvo, and then I'll say something about it. Nicht 
Sprawdź układ wykrywania pieszych z funkcją automatycznego hamowania. This is a commercial. Now, in commercial, you can do whatever you like, but this is a, an actual system. Uh, Volvo sold already 50,000 uh, cars that have this system. So it's, it, it's a camera uh, detecting pedestrians, cars, and, and other uh, objects, but specifically the pedestrian detection. When a pedestrian is detected uh, in a collision course, the car emits a warning signal, and if the collision is still imminent, the car will actually brake. Now, when you go and buy a car at the dealership, they take you for a spin. And here's a clip that I downloaded from the internet. There, at the end of the road. So this is automatic uh, braking. The driver did not brake, and on the cluster, it appears that it was broken by... Uh, the brake was automatically. So th these are systems that uh, you have today. Volvo specifically launched it uh, six months ago, and as I said, <coughs> so far 50,000 uh, units have been sold. Actually, if you want to buy this car, there's a waiting list of a si at least six months uh, because of the system. This is what uh, Volvo claim. Um, this is just a list of car manufacturers and years of uh, launching introduction of systems like this, systems that do pedestrian detection, vehicle detection, traffic sign recognition, uh, road analysis, detecting lanes, uh, emitting warnings uh, when there's a lane departure, uh, force feedback control by maintaining the, the car in the center of the road. Just in 2010, we, 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 uh, my, my company is the leader in this area, we sold 300,000 units. By 2014, several car manufacturers are introducing this as standard fit in all cars, and uh, in 2015, it's expected to have a widespread uh, standard fit. Also, the regulators are playing a very active role in this, in this area because these are technologies that on one hand are affordable. You know, it's, it's only a camera, so a camera sensor is a few dollars, microprocessor is a few dollars, electronics, a few dollars, that's it. So it's very, very affordable and it saves lives. So regulators are actively involved in regulating by introducing star ratings to encourage car manufacturers to introduce these uh, systems. And this is exactly what, what, what is happening. Uh, in terms of under the hood, here's a clip uh, showing what the system does. Uh, when you have a square, it's a detecting the detection of a vehicle. A rectangle is a detection of a motorcycle or a pedestrian. Uh, red means the pedestrian is in a collision, collision course. Uh, blue and white mean the pedestrian is, is in positions outside of a collision, a collision course. Well, what you can see here is that pedestrians are usually found in a lot of clutter. It's not that you have a classical situation in which a pedestrian is standing in the middle of the road and you need to detect it. It's standing among, amidst many, many uh, uh, distractors and, and clutter. And you need to be able to detect the pedestrian and only the pedestrian and not anything, uh, not anything else. So this is a very challenging uh, problem. As an example of a traffic sign recognition, uh, there are about 40 to 50 different traffic signs that the system needs to, uh, needs to detect. Once a traffic sign is being detected, the car, the driver gets information about the speed limit information and other information related to the signs that were, uh, that were detected. This was launched already in 2008 by BMW and now launched by many, many other car manufacturers. So overall, when, when you look at, at the applications uh, that you have in, in, in a car, um, most of the application is, the fa is a forward-facing uh, uh, camera. There is a lane analysis for lane departure warning, uh, high beam uh, control. The car can automatically turn on the high beams by scanning the image and understanding uh, the scene. Uh, forward collision warning against vehicles and pedestrians, the pedestrian detection, and uh, collision mitigation by braking and, and so forth. And, the roadmap is going into semi-autonomous and autonomous uh, driving. And the key computer vision technologies are surrounding object recognition and identification, like I said, pedestrians, cars, traffic signs, motion estimation technologies. There's a lot of motion estimation and structure for motion going on here. And uh, roadway understanding, which makes us to understand the scene itself in order to predict 
all sorts of uh, collision uh, situations. So in terms of key development uh, principles behind this, uh, in terms of, well, there's software and hardware. <clears throat> in terms of software, uh, we use a lot of statistical uh, learning uh, techniques, both uh, linear and also uh, nonlinear estimators. Uh, we use a cascade model, which simple classifiers work densely over the image on every pixel, and then much more advanced classifiers work only on selected regions on the image. In terms of uh, measurements, it's not clear what kind of measurements one needs to make out of, uh, out of images, whether to take the pixel values, to take gradients, to take uh, histograms of gradients, to take histograms of other uh, measurements, to do sub-similarity uh, measurements. So what, what we do, we collect all sorts of measurements, all what you can imagine, and then let a, a greedy approach through learning select those measurements that reduce the classification loss as much as, uh, as, much as possible. Uh, data, it's lots of it. This is something that goes way beyond what one can acquire in, in a scientific setting in academia. We're talking about training sets in the millions and tens of millions. Um, and they cover the narrow domain of the problem. And this is very important. Uh, the fact that the domain is narrow enables us to develop systems that actually work. When you widen the, the, the domain, it becomes much more difficult. <clears throat> There's also do domain constraints. We have a very uh, constraint on a computing budget because it's a portable system. Uh, power consumption, the power consumption on an electronic system in a car is about two watts. The power consumption of a, you know, a MacBook Air is about 45 watts, just to give you an order of, of scale. And there are all sorts of real-time constraints that dictate algorithmic approach. And actually, those constraints are good for development, because when you are not constrained, you tend up to develop algorithms that not really meet uh, reality later on. The fact that you have constraints pushes you to develop algorithms that, that actually uh, work. In terms of uh, uh, incrementality, typically what we found is that there isn't a super algorithm. It's not that we have developed an algorithm that works very differently from what, what you know about. Actually, what has been developed are layers. Sophisticated advanced algorithms, but work one on top of the other. Usually, the, the nth layer tries to resolve, it's kind of a repair mechanism, me mechanism tries to resolve problems that the n minus one layer uh, was, not able to, uh, was not able to solve. And you can find similar things in, in, uh, in biology. This is something that I uh, took from discussions with uh, Tommy Poggio, like DNA repair mechanisms, uh, the structure of the visual cortex, the layered structure of the visual cortex. So there are indications that a layered approach is really the right thing to do. And this is something what, that we ended up uh, doing uh, in, in our development. In terms of hardware considerations, I'll, I'll finish in, in, in a moment, we ended up developing our own microprocessor because there isn't a microprocessor today that is suited for computer vision. Uh, in the tomorrow's panel, I'll uh, explain a bit more about uh, hardware considerations. And uh, near future uh, roadmaps is all the things that take us to uh, autonomous driving. I'll talk about this later uh, tomorrow. In terms of the broader challenge, I'll just end here, is that one can make the following conjecture, is that if you have a single object class, or O of one object classes, a small number of object classes, the state of the art that exists today with sufficient resources are sufficient to make systems that work. But humans can effortlessly handle you know, thousands of object classes, 10,000 object classes. Replicating resources is unpractical, unwieldy. So the next big challenge is how to achieve sublinear growth in, term, in resources when the number of classes grows to the thousands. And this is something that I'll also describe a bit in detail in the panel tomorrow. Okay, thank you.